Hello everyone. Today we are going to study the eyeball. So to begin with, this is a picture of the eye as seen from the front. You can see the upper eyelid, you can see the lower eyelid, you can see the rows of eyelashes and you can see the medial angle which is also called the medial canthus. You can see the lateral angle which is called the lateral canthus and this gap between the eyelid margins is called the palpebral fissure. So a small part of the eyeball eye can be seen through the palpebral fissure and a larger part is hidden inside the orbit. So the major part of the eyeball is hidden within the orbit and a small part is projecting anteriorly and which can be covered by the eyelids. Now at the medial canthus there is a greater depression at the lateral canthus there is a smaller depression. This larger depression over here is called the lacrimal lake and this fleshy triangular mass is the lacrimal caruncle. Now somewhere here at in the lid margin and somewhere here you have the lacrimal punctum and this lacrimal punctum will lead to the lacrimal canaliculi and the lacrimal sac and the nasolacrimal duct. However that is not the topic of discussion today. The eyelids and the lacrimal apparatus is a separate issue. Anyway this much of the eyeball as you can see through the palpebral fissure let's focus on that. This part of here, this is a sclera covered by the conjunctiva and these vessels that you can see, these spider like vessels, these are the conjunctival blood vessels. Underneath also you have the episcleral vessels but they are not so prominent anteriorly. The most prominent vessels that you can see here are mostly the conjunctival vessels and this shiny thing over here, this is the cornea. This is one of the major refractive parts of the eyeball. So this is the cornea. And at the air tear film cornea interface, a large part of the total refractive power of the eye takes place. So you know the total refractive power of the eye is something around uh, 58 diopters of which about say uh, something around 40 diopters is by the uh, plus 10 diopters is by the lens and something around 40 diopters is by the cornea. So actually the cornea is the major refracting surface of the eyeball. It is much more a powerful refracting surface than the lens. However, the advantage of the lens is that it, it can change its shape. So the lens is responsible for accommodation. But as far as pure refraction is concerned, the cornea is as important as the lens. Now if you look at this cornea over here, through the cornea you can see this blue portion. This is the iris. It is blue because it is sparsely pigmented in this individual. So this is the blue iris and at the central aperture of the iris you can see the pupil. So this is the pupillary margin, this is the iris, this is the peripheral part of the iris and this is the peripheral part of the cornea as well. Now this transition between the sclera and the cornea, this sclerocorneal junction is called the limbus. So at the limbus you have a transition from the columnar epithelium of the conjunctiva to this commas epithelium of the cornea. So this is the sclerocorneal junction. Now conjunctiva itself is concerned. This that you can see is the bulbar conjunctiva, the part which covers the anterior part of the sclera. Now this conjunctiva is going up and it is reflected from the inner margin of the eyelids, the inner surface of the eyelids. So when it is being reflected from the eyeball to the eyelids, that is from the bulbar conjunctiva to the palpebral conjunctiva, it will form a pocket all round over here which is called the fornix of the conjunctiva. So you have a superior conjunctival fornix, you have an inferior conjunctival fornix. So conjunctiva, bulbar conjunctiva, palpebral conjunctiva and conjunctival fornix and these conjunctival blood vessels as you can see. The most of the conjunctiva is covered by a stratified columnar epithelium. So conjunctiva with its stratified columnar epithelium and now let us go on to the next picture. Yeah, this is a model of the eyeball as you can actually Amazon. Yeah, people usually buy this for horror effects or playing pranks on other people. Now even this model is remarkably lifelike and even here you can see the central aperture of the pupil. You can see the iris that is the diaphragm of the pupil. You can see the sclerocorneal junction over here and you can see the sclera. So this exposed part of the sclera over here is covered by the bulbar conjunctiva. And 
from the sclera it is going to be reflected at this margin which would be the superior fornix of the conjunctiva this would be the inferior conjunctival fornix and from here and from here the conjunctiva will be reflected from the eyeball onto the inner surface of the eyelids and just to take a look at these pockets these conjunctival fornices these are places where actually the foreign bodies which enter the through the palpebral aperture they are frequently lost which you can discuss by syringing and washing out so this model of the eyeball is also quite interesting now let us go to a sectional view here you have a sectional view of the eyeball the typical simplified eyeball which you have been studying from your lower biology classes and as you already know the eye has got three coats or three tunics it has got from outside to inwards a fibrous tunic and then it has got a vascular tunic and it has got a nervous tunic so the outermost layer of the eyeball is the sclera so this blue thing this is the sclera as you can see and this sclera sclera is continuous with the dura mater surrounding the optic nerve now the eyeball itself is a prolongation of the brain actually the retina is a prolongation of the brain and this optic nerve is equivalent to the nerve tracts within the brain so actually the retina is just a projection of the brain with the optic nerve as a tract connecting it to the rest of the diencephalon that is the diencephalon of the developing brain so coming back to the sclera this is the sclera the outermost top fibrous coat which is continuous with the dura mater and this sclera as you can see it affords attachment to the extraocular muscle so you have attachment of the extraocular muscle here you have attachment of the extraocular muscle here and you can see that posteriorly the sclera is pierced by the optic nerve so this must be a region of weakness of the sclera because it is perforated by the optic nerves with so many fibers this region of the sclera is quite thin and sieve like so this is the sclera its sclera is not actually thin diameter wise but because of the number of perforations that you have so the sclera is weak over here in fact diameter wise or thickness wise the sclera is much more thinner somewhere here anteriorly where the extraocular muscles are attached this is the thinner this sclera posteriorly the sclera is actually thicker but because of this number of nerves bundles of the optic nerve piercing the sclera this portion is a weak spot of the sclera so the sclera and you can make out the sclera is continuous with the cornea so posterior 5/6 of the globe is the sclera and anterior 1/6 is the cornea and you can make out that the cornea has a greater radius of curvature than the sclera so it forms a part of a smaller circle so this is the cornea which is the anterior continuation of the sclera so the outer fiber coat consists of the posterior sclera and the anterior cornea and as usual over here you have the sclerocorneal junction the limbus which is a small depression between the curvature of the cornea and the curvature of the sclera so sclera cornea sclerocorneal junction of the limbus and the lamina cribrosa scleri or the cribrum region or the perforated region of the sclera where you have the entry of the filaments of the optic nerve that is all that you can see in this picture so the cornea you have seen it is not being colored it is colorless because it is transparent and the sclera is opaque although sclera and cornea both contain collagen fibers but the cornea is opaque because first of all it does not have blood vessels it is avascular the nerve endings that you have in the cornea they are non myelinated and the corneal collagen fibers are very short in length they are actually shorter than the bandwidth of the visible light and not only that these uh, for these collagen bundles within the cornea are stacked in a parallel arrangement and regular arrangement so that there is minimum scattering of light these are most of mostly the reasons why the cornea is transparent as the sclera has got bundles more irregular collagen bundles and the sclera has got blood vessels it has got episcleral vessels on the outside penetrating blood vessels into the sclera and from inside it has got the choroidal blood vessels again supplying the sclera so the sclera is vascular the sclera has got irregular and coarser collagen and that is why the sclera is opaque whereas the cornea is transparent now the cornea as you can make out is quite exposed 
because the cornea is exposed over here there is a chance of drying of the cornea which is prevented by the tear film and the tear film as you know is a composite of lacrimal secretions and the secretions from the goblet cells within the conjunctiva the conjunctival epithelium also contains goblet cells so secretions from the goblet cells secretions from the lacrimal glands they are all helping in moistening the cornea and the cornea gets its oxygen from the atmosphere and on the inner surface the cornea is nourished by the aqueous humor which is filling the anterior chamber over here so that is more or less the supply of nutrition and oxygen for the cornea because the cornea has got mainly collagen fibers with few fibroblasts in between very few so its nutritional requirements are also not very much only the outer and inner surface they will be having a good nutritional requirement because they are cellular the middle thicker part of the cornea is mostly collagen tissue so it does not have much of a nutritional requirement however we will come to that later so you see you have taken a look at the sclera and the cornea now the middle vascular port posteriorly forms the choroid anteriorly forms the ciliary body and the iris and this choroid you know it has got some loose tissue it has got some amount of collagen fibers it has got melanin pigment and it has got a very large number of blood vessels now these choroidal blood vessels they are derived from the long and short posterior ciliary vessels so these long and short posterior ciliary arteries they actually pass between the sclera and the retina they pass through the choroid and so this is the vascular part of the eyeball and it is also called the uveal tract because from inside the eyeball this looks purplish and it looks like a grape that is why this is called the uveal tract so this choroid it carries blood vessels which supply the sclera on the outside and which supply the retina on the inside so it's a conduit for blood vessels and it also contains a huge number of pigment melanin pigment so that the light entering the eyeball is not uh, scattered in different directions but it follows a regular pathway with into the retina so to prevent the diffraction and diffusing of light and to absorb the light scattered in various directions you have this pigment layer within the choroid so the choroid mainly contains some loose tissue it contains pigments and it contains blood vessels now this anterior part of the choroid is the ciliary body over here the ciliary body has got a number of functions one is it gives support to the uh, ligament of the lens so this supporting suspensory ligament of the lens is attached to the ciliary body and the ciliary body is responsible for secreting the aqueous humor and the ciliary body contains the ciliary muscles so this aqueous humor secreted by the ciliary body passes from the posterior chamber through the pupillary aperture into the anterior chamber and is absorbed at the sclerocorneal junction over here so these are roughly the functions of the ciliary body providing support to the lens altering tension on the sensory ligament and altering the curvatures of the lens and secretion of aqueous humor now we have already said that ciliary body contains the ciliary muscles and you can see that the ciliary body is roughly triangular with the apex behind and the base in front so the posterior part of the ciliary body is plane it's called pars plana anterior part of the ciliary body is corrugated so it's a plicated part so it is called pars plicata and these corrugations are actually the ciliary processes and the grooves of the ciliary processes give attachment to the suspensory ligament of the lens and beyond the ciliary body the choroid is continued as the iris this iris here forms a movable diaphragm which actually regulates the aperture in front of the lens which regulates the pupillary aperture in front of the lens and regulates the amount of light which will enter the lens and the vitreous and will strike the retina so this regulates the amount of light entering the eyeball through the pupil that means this pupil has two sets of muscles it has a sphincter pupillae or a constrictor pupillae close to the margin and it has a dilator pupillae close to the root so the iris forms the margins of the pupillary aperture it forms a diaphragm of the eyeball and it contains a sphincter pupillary muscle and a dilator pupillary muscle and it is covered by an epithelium anteriorly as well as posteriorly and not only that just like the other parts of the choroid the ciliary body also is heavily pigmented the iris is also heavily pigmented what you can see is there is this yellow extension from the retina 
so you can make out that the retina apart from its neural functions in the posterior segment the retina is continued over the iris and the ciliary body as a thin extension so the non neural part of the retina continues as a double layered epithelium over the ciliary body and the iris and this is called the iridal part the ciliary part of the retina and this is called the iridal part of the retina or to put it in more fanciful names pars ciliaris retini and pars iridis retini and somewhere here there is a junction between the neural part of the retina and the anterior non neural extension of the retina this is a serrated boundary which is called the ora serrata you can't see it in this diagram you may be able to see it in subsequent diagrams but over here there is a junction between the neural and non neural parts of the retina behind the ora serrata you have the neural component or the neural parts of the retina in front of the ora serrata you have a non neural extension of the retina covering the ciliary body and covering the iris so you have seen the fibrous cord and the vascular cord now we come to the nervous cord that is the retina so this nervous cord that is the retina is the part which leads to the optic nerve so within the retina you must be having the cells which will give the first order of neurons entering into the optic nerve and you can see the posterior inner lining of the entire eyeball constitutes the retina and anteriorly beyond the ora serrata it the retina extends as the ciliary part of the retina and the iridal part of the retina and not only that you can make out that this if you go to the antero posterior axis of the eyeball from the center of the cornea over here to the center of the posterior pole you can also see one surprising thing that the optic nerve does not enter at the posterior pole of the eyeball rather the optic nerve enters somewhat medial to the posterior pole of the eyeball so although uh, this is a vertical section if we have a horizontal section it will be more clear that the optic nerve does not enter at the posterior pole of the eyeball it enters somewhat medial to the posterior pole of the eyeball and the place on the retina where the optic nerve enters is called the blind spot it is the region where you don't have any rods and cones so it is a part where the vision is least again there is another important part of the retina which is called the uh, macula macula lutea and in the macula lutea there is a depression so this macula lutea is the most acute or most sensitive part of the retina visual acuity is greatest at the macula and this macula is a small depression which is somewhat lateral to the posterior pole of the eyeball and within the macula lutea you have a pinpoint central region which is called the fovea centralis and the fovea centralis again within the macula is the part where you have the most clear and the most acute vision so the point is if you have an antero posterior axis of the eyeball the optic nerve enters somewhat medial to the posterior pole and the fovea centralis is located somewhat lateral to the posterior pole of the eyeball now apart from this now this retina has got several layers the histology of the retina and the layers we will study last of all apart from these structures you can make out the lens over here the crystalline lens as it calls because the lens fibers which are actually mature lens cells they are filled with the crystalline protein and this you can see that the lens has got a capsule and it has got an anterior curvature it has got a posterior curvature and you can see posteriorly the lens is more con convex than anteriorly and at the periphery of the lens at the uh, this is the anterior pole of the lens and this is the posterior pole of the lens and this is roughly the equator of the lens in the equatorial region of the lens you can see you have the fibers of the zonular ligament or the suspensory ligament of the lens which these fibers are attached to the grooves between the ciliary processes of the ciliary body so you have the lens you have the lens capsule and you have the suspensory ligament of the lens apart from that you can make out this big pink chamber this is the vitreous chamber and this vitreous chamber is has the vitreous humor which is a dense jelly like substance it is actually gelatinous 
and this vitreous is bound by the vitreous membrane. So this entire vitreous chamber is actually contained in a thin membrane that is called vitreous membrane and you can see and you can see that anteriorly this vitreous membrane has a concavity in which the posterior surface of the lens is resting and this depression in the vitreous membrane is called the hyaloid fossa. So the lens indents the vitreous chamber forming the hyaloid fossa and the margins of the vitreous membrane anteriorly are thickened and the thickened anterior fibers of the vitreous membrane are supposed to be the suspensory ligament of the lens. So the suspensory ligament of the lens is actually derived from the thickened anterior part of this vitreous membrane and the suspensory ligament as we have said is attached to the grooves between the ciliary processes of the ciliary body. So now we have studied the vitreous chamber, vitreous chamber, vitreous membrane, hyaloid fossa. What is remaining is the anterior part over here. Now this part of the eyeball is called the anterior segment. This part of the eyeball is called the posterior segment. Again within the anterior segment you have the anterior chamber between the cornea and the iris and you have the posterior chamber between the iris and the lens. So anterior chamber, posterior chamber, anterior segment, posterior segment. Now this anterior and posterior chambers are filled by the aqueous humor. So this aqueous humor and vitreous humor together are responsible for maintaining the pressure inside the eyeball, for maintaining the shape of the eyeball along with the sclera. The stiffness of the sclera also helps to maintain the shape of the eyeball. The pressure within the vitreous and the aqueous humor helps to oppose the retina against the choroid and maintain the retina stiffly against the choroid and prevent the retinal detachment from the choroid and this uh, position of the, the turgidity of the aqueous and vitreous humors maintains all the structures within the eyeball in their respective orientation within a very small area. Actually the entire diameter of the eyeball in the human eye is about 1 inch, about 2.5 centimeters. So it's not a very big organ and there are multiple small minute structures which have to function perfectly within this uh, one inch of an eyeball. So that is why the tension within the eyeball has to be maintained within very narrow limits within about 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury and if the tension exceeds to beyond say 23 millimeters of mercury definitely it will be called abnormal. Now this is all that we can learn from this simplified diagram. If we go to a more complicated diagram, suppose you look at this diagram. In diagram everything that we have said before but with a little more clarity. You can see the sclera here and you can see that posteriorly the sclera is pierced by the optic nerve and you can make out that the sclera is continuous with the dura mater just as the choroid uh, is continuous with the pia and arachnoid matter. So the dura is continuous, uh, the sclera is continuous with the dura mater around the optic nerve and the choroid is continuous with the pia arachnoid around the optic nerve and the retina is actually a prolongation of the brain itself connected by the fibers of the optic nerve. And again in, in this diagram you can see the ciliary body a bit more clearly. You can see the corrugated part, the pars plicata and posteriorly the pars plana. What else you can see in this diagram is you can make out the ora serata. Which you could not see in this schematic. We were saying that the ora serata is somewhere here where the retina from its neural part it will extend as a double layer of epithelium over the ciliary body and the iris. So somewhere here is a serrated margin of the retina, the ora serrata. That you can see over here. You can see the serrated margin of the retina and you can make out that this inner retinal core beyond the ora serrata, it has actually covered the ciliary body and iris. So this is the nervous part of the retina and this is the non-nervous part of the retina extending over the ciliary body and the iris. And again, this is the lateral rectus and this is the medial rectus as you can see, this is the right eye as viewed from above. So this is a transverse section of the right eyeball. And you can make out here that if you draw an anteroposterior axis of the eyeball from the anterior pole to the posterior pole, you will find that the 
optic nerve is slightly medial to the posterior pole and the fovea and the macula lutea they are slightly lateral to the posterior pole so even the macula and the fovea they are not exactly at the posterior pole of the eyeball they are slightly lateral to the posterior pole and the optic nerve is slightly medial to the posterior pole and again in di this diagram you can make out the anterior chamber the posterior chamber the anterior segment of the eyeball the posterior segment of the eyeball and you can see along with the optic nerve the central artery and vein of the retina and they are giving the branches and these branches are going around the macula lutea so none of these vessels actually go through the macula lutea it is the macula lutea are not supplied by large blood vessels so that the acuity of vision can be maintained without interference with from too much of blood so this is another classic diagram of the eyeball and more or less this reinforces what we have seen in the previous diagrams now let us go to the next picture here you can see the conjunctival epithelium and in this picture you can see the cornea so here we are actually going into the structure of the conjunctiva so this conjunctival epithelium is a stratified columnar epithelium with an underlying layer of five loose fibrous tissue now this stratified columnar epithelium contains numerous goblet cells so that apart from the secretion of the lacrimal glands and the secretion of the tarsal glands from the eyelids you have the secretions from the goblet cells of the conjunctiva so secretions of the tarsal glands and the eyelid glands secretions of the lacrimal glands and secretions of the goblet cells from the conjunctiva the three sets of secretions together make up the tear film part of it is watery part of it is oily part of it is mucous so it has different functions and it's a multi purpose fluid lubricating the anterior surface of the cornea now if you come to the cornea the cornea histology is actually much more important because uh, the pathology of the cornea is much more dangerous and much more detrimental to vision and besides the cornea's histology has been of great importance in these days because of the increasing cases of corneal transplant both partial and total corneal transplants so from the surface you have a corneal epithelium and on the deepest layer you have a corneal endothelium the corneal epithelium is stratified squamous the corneal endothelium is flattened squamous single layered squamous epithelium now underneath the stratified squamous epithelium of the cornea you have a fibrous layer which is the bowman's membrane and underneath the corneal endothelium you have this membrane this desmet's membrane is supposed to be the basement membrane of the corneal endothelium and between the bowman's membrane over here and the desmet's membrane over here you have the stroma of the cornea that is called the substantia propria that is actually made up of multiple layers of collagen fibers which are arranged regularly and as we have said these collagen fibers are very short in length and because they are short and regularly arranged and because the cornea does not have any blood vessels the nerve endings that are there are mostly naked nerve endings and non myelinated so the cornea is transparent not only that this endothelium of the desmet membrane has got different membrane pumps which maintains an optimal state of hydration of the cornea so there is no excess water logging within the cornea which helps to maintain the corneal transparency now here in this diagram you can see the posterior part of the eye the posterior pole of the eyeball that we are looking at the pole of we want to see the place where the optic nerve pierces the eyeball so here you can see the optic nerve piercing the eyeball and around the optic nerve there are some other structures which are piercing the sclera so we have already said that this is a weak region of the sclera and you have multiple structures piercing the eyeball in this region so what are these additional structures that are piercing the eyeball around the optic nerve you have the long and short posterior ciliary arteries and the long and short posterior ciliary nerves you already know that these long long posterior ciliary the long ciliary nerves now in the nerves you have only long ciliary and short ciliary no posterior and anterior but in blood vessels you have the long short posterior ciliary arteries and veins and you also have anterior ciliary arteries 
now as far as nerves are concerned the long posterior the long ciliary nerves not posterior but the long ciliary nerves are branches of the nasociliary nerve direct branches of the nasociliary nerves whereas the short ciliary nerves they have come out of the ciliary ganglia and you already know that the short ciliary nerves carry both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers of which the parasympathetic fibers are derived from the oculomotor nerve and they are going to supply the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles and you know that the sympathetic fibers they are going to supply the uh, dilator pupillae so the sympathetics are going to supply the dilator pupillae and the parasympathetics are going to supply the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles now the sympathetic fibers may pass either through the long ciliary or short ciliary or through both but the parasympathetic fibers will pass only through the short ciliary nerves now this long and short posterior ciliary arteries these are derived from the ophthalmic artery and they are passing forward between the sclera and the choroid and the art anterior ciliary arteries are from the muscular branches to the extraocular muscles and apart from that you can see these four vortex veins these are actually the these are actually the drainage larger veins arising from the episcleral vein so so some of these episcleral and scleral veins they combine to form the large vortex veins which drain into the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins so these veni vorticosi or vortex veins the optic nerve the long and short posterior ciliary vessels and the long and short ciliary nerves these are the structures which are piercing the sclera posteriorly and that is why this diagram is important now again in this diagram in this schematic you can again make out that the optic nerve is situated medial and slightly above the posterior pole and what is not shown is that the macula lutea and the fovea centralis is slightly medial to the posterior pole now the macula and fovea is almost at the posterior pole but it is slightly laterally slightly laterally over here so the optic nerve slightly medial to the posterior pole and the macula and fovea slightly lateral to the posterior pole now again in this schematic diagram you can look at the veni vorticosi or the vortex veins which are piercing the sclera slightly behind the equator and the long posterior ciliary arteries and over here you have the short posterior ciliary arteries and the optic nerve in this point so again you have the structures piercing the sclera the long and short posterior ciliary vessels the uh, long ciliary nerves and the short ciliary nerves and the veni vorticosi or the vortex veins these are the structures which are piercing the sclera behind the equator in this diagram you can again make out as we have said that the sclera is thin in front and thick behind but although the sclera is thick behind in this point it is weakened by the passage of the optic nerve filaments and in this thin anterior part of the sclera you have the attachment of the extraocular muscles so this is the region where the extraocular muscles are also going to be attached and apart from that you can see this tenon's capsule this is tenon's capsule is derived from the fascia of the eyeball which is called the bulbar fascia so this bulbar fascia or tenon's capsule is a loose loose fascial sheath which encloses the eyeball and the eyeball moves by the traction of the extraocular muscles within the fascia bulbar so this fascial coverings of the eyeball and the suspensory mechanism of the eyeball we will study when we study the orbit later on not right now now here we are taking a look at the iris and the ciliary body and the irido corneal junction that is we are trying to take a detailed look at the formation and the aqueous circulation that is the formation and drainage of aqueous humor now in this diagram again you can see the sclera over here you can see the bulbar conjunctiva over the sclera and you can see over here you have the sclerocorneal junction that is the limbus and you can make out the anterior ciliary vessels which are passing through the sclera and going to the episcleral veins now what is important here is anteriorly the sclera has got a small opening within it close to the sclerocorneal junction this is called the canal of schlem or sinus venosus scleri 
this is an important structure it is within the sclera close to the sclerocorneal junction and on the inner surface of the sinus venosa scleri you have a projecting ridge of the sclera which is called the sclera spar so this is the sclerocorneal junction the sinus venosa scleri or the canal of schlem and over here you have the scleral spar now this scleral spar is important because this scleral spar is one of the points of attachment to these muscles of the ciliary body so these ciliary muscles take their attachment to the scleral spar over here and posteriorly they are attached to the end of the ciliary body that is to the supracoroid lamina now over the choroid between the sclera and the choroid there is a fibrous layer called the supracoroid lamina and these ciliary muscles extend from the supracoroid lamina right anteriorly up to the scleral spar and these ciliary muscles are in three layers there are meridional muscles there are radial or oblique muscles and there are circular muscles so here you can see these meridional muscles which would be also you could call them longitudinal muscles and the radial muscles would be the oblique muscles and you have the circular muscles which would be transverse muscles so longitudinal transverse and oblique muscles meridional radial or oblique and circular muscles these are the three sets of ciliary muscles that you have within the ciliary body and posteriorly they extend up to the supracoroid lamina anteriorly they extend up to the ciliary processes and further anteriorly these muscles are attached to the scleral spar that is the small ridge of stiff scleral tissue medial to the sinus venosa scleri and close to the sclerocorneal junction now here you can see the ciliary body and you can make out a projection of the retina as a bilaminar surface epithelium covering the ciliary body and extending on to the iris so you can see that the iris has got an anterior surface it has got a posterior surface and it has got the free pupillary margin and you can see that within the substance of the iris you have got close to the pupillary margin the sphincter pupilli and away from the pupillary margin the dilator pupilli muscles so these are circular muscles and these are radial muscles so sphincter pupilli dilator pupilli and numerous blood vessels within the iris the iris is quite richly supplied with blood vessels and you can make out the anterior surface of the iris has got a number of folds and apart from these blood vessels and pupillary muscles the iris also has got is richly supplied with melanocytes and melanin pigments and again just as the retina covers the ciliary body in a bilaminar epithelial layer called this ciliary part of the retina so it also covers the iris with a posterior epithelium which is called the iridial part of the retina now coming to the anterior surface of the iris here you can see the junction between the iris and the cornea that is the iridocornea angle and at this iridocornea angle you can see this trabecular meshwork this you can see here a trabecular meshwork at the iridocornea angle so you see this entire trabecular meshwork that you can see at the iridocornea angle this actually is derived from the desmets membrane you know that the we have been saying that in the cornea you have the corneal epithelium bowman's membrane substantia propria and the desmets membrane and the corneal endothelium so that desmets membrane the inner fibrous lining of the cornea that desmets membrane when it comes to the iridocorneal angle it breaks up into a mesh and that mesh is actually the trabecular meshwork at the iridocorneal angle and in between the fibers of the mesh derived from the desmet membrane there are spaces and those spaces are called the spaces of fontana so what happens is that the one of the functions of the ciliary body is to secrete the aqueous humor now again we remind you that the ciliary body is triangular with the apex posteriorly base anteriorly anteriorly towards the base and the medial surface the ciliary body is corrugated which is the corrugated part of the ciliary body called the pars plicata and posteriorly you have the plain part of the ciliary body called the pars plana and in the pars plicata these elevations they are called the ciliary processes and the fibers the zonular fibers or the suspensory ligament of the lens are attached into the grooves between the ciliary processes so we recapitulate that and this these ciliary processes secrete the aqueous humor by filtration from the blood
and this aqueous humor first is liberated into the posterior chamber and then it has to make its way between the lens and the pupil. It has to slide across between the lens and the pupil and reach the anterior chamber. And from the ciliary body to the posterior chamber, across the space between the iris and the pupil, uh, iris and the lens, and through the pupillary margin, it has to reach the anterior chamber. And then when it reaches the anterior chamber, it passes into this iridocorneal angle. This is also called the angle of filtration. And here you have that trabecular meshwork derived from the basement, derived from the desmex membrane of the cornea. And between through the meshes of that trabecular network, it flows through the spaces of Fontana and is collected by this canal of Schlem. And from this canal of Schlem, you have minute channels which flow out into the anterior ciliary veins and into the episcleral veins. So again, from the ciliary B to the posterior chamber, the gap between the pupil and lens to the anterior chamber, into the trabecular meshwork, into the spaces of Fontana, into the canal of Schlem, into the small channels through the canal of Schlem, connecting it with the, these small channels are called the aqueous veins. The small aqueous veins arising from the canal of Schlem, connecting it to the anterior ciliary vein and connecting it to the episcleral venous network. This is the entire pathway of circulation of aqueous humor. So aqueous circulation is important. So you can make out that there are a number of places where this aqueous circulation can be obstructed. You can see that this aqueous humor can be obstructed in the gap between the iris and the lens because the iris is usually touching the lens. So this aqueous humor must attain a sufficient amount of pressure so that it can push into the gap between this iris and the lens. And only when the aqueous humor has attained the pressure can it do this gap, reach the anterior chamber and go into this filtration angle. So this is one potential space of obstruction. So if you have inflammation of the iris or swelling of the lens, then the pressure will build up and the aqueous humor circulation will be hampered giving rise to intraocular tension, the intraocular tension may be raised. Again, within the anterior chamber, if this angle of filtration is blocked by inflammatory material, uh, debris, red blood and white blood cells, or fibrosis, or ingrowing blood vessels in diabetes mellitus when you have a proliferative retinopathy or a proliferation in the iridocorneal angle, when whatever obstruction you have within these trabecular meshwork, it will impede or it will resist the flow of the aqueous humor into the canal of Schlem. So here you can understand the mechanism of glaucoma. Not only that, this, this iridocorneal angle, if it narrows, if this lens or this inflammation in the posterior chamber pushes the iris anteriorly or you have, if you have a congenitally narrow anterior chamber, then also you are going to have an acute angle glaucoma or if you have a wide angle but there is an inflammation and fibrosis or obliteration of the trabecular meshwork then also you might have a broad angle or open angle or wide angle glaucoma. Most of the cases of glaucoma are actually open angle or wide angle glaucoma. Some of the cases are narrow angle glaucoma which is actually a more acute condition. So these are all the things that you can see from this picture. And also you can make out that the ciliary body uh, is actually giving attachment to the suspensory fibers of the lens and you can take a look at this lens and you can see the central part of the lens is a hard, more hardened than the peripheral part and it is called the lens nucleus and you can make out the lens is layered anion. So you have several layers of these lens fibers. These lens fibers are nothing but the proliferation of the lens cells. Now these crystalline lens in its earlier developmental part, it was cellular, it had an anterior lens epithelium, it had a posterior lens epithelium. From the posterior lens epithelium, you had the original lens fibers projecting and passing anteriorly. And when they mature, most of their organelles are lost and these lens fibers are then filled by a lens protein called crystalline. And after maturity, the secondary lens fibers arising from the equatorial region of the lens cells over here from the lens epithelium, they are giving rise to the secondary lens fibers. So all these lens fibers, the primary and secondary arising as projections of these lens epithelium, they meet at several junctional points. So there are two Y-shaped junctions of these lens fibers. 
one close to the anterior surface of the lens and one close to the posterior surface of the lens. So you can understand the lens has got a more thinner part which is the cortex of the lens and it has got a denser part which is called the nucleus of the lens. And as a person matures and ages, the lens becomes increasingly thick and opaque and the nucleus becomes harder and harder. And this opacity of the lens is what is called cataract. So a cataract is any opacity of the lens, whether it's a nuclear cataract or it's a cortical cataract, whether it's a congenital cataract or a traumatic cataract or whatever. Any opacity of the lens is called a cataract. And if you have a cataract, then you have to remove the lens. Previously, the entire lens along with its capsule was removed by tearing across the zonular ligament, lowered as by the phacoemulsification and phacofragmentation. Only the lens matter is removed and the shell of the lens capsule kept intact and into the shell of the lens capsule you are fitting an intraocular lens. So we have already discussed the links from this diagram. Let us see what is in the next. In this simplified diagram again you can make out the uh, iris and the ciliary body and you can make out the constrictor pupillae towards the free margin of the iris and the dilator pupillae towards the root of the iris and the ciliary muscles, the longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles and the ciliary processes in this schematic. And you can make out somewhere here is the anterior chamber, somewhere here is the posterior chamber and over here you have the suspensory ligament of the lens. Now in this diagram again the same features are highlighted. Here you can see somewhere here is the scleral spur and you can see from the scleral spur the attachment of the longitudinal muscles of the ciliary body and over here you can make out the radial muscles of the ciliary body and so you can make out the different groups of the collagen fibers. So this is actually a schematic of the ciliary body. What is important from this diagram is that we are going to look at the functioning of the ciliary body and how the ciliary muscles help in accommodation or altering the curvature of the lens. So we have said that the ciliary body has got longitudinal muscles, it has got oblique muscles, it has got circular muscles. So you have longitudinal muscles, you have oblique muscles and you have circular muscles. Now, when you are looking at a distant object, by distant object we mean any object beyond 20 feet or 6 meters. So any object when you are looking at beyond uh, 20 feet or 6 meters, we say it is distant vision. When it is coming within 20 feet, gradually the curvature of the lens has to be increased to focus the item properly on the retina. So when within 20 feet the object is moving close to your eye, then the curvature of the lens gradually needs to be increased to focus the lens properly on the retina and within this 6 meters you need the phenomenon of accommodation. What happens in accommodation is that the ciliary muscles contract and when the ciliary muscles contract the ciliary body slides anteriorly and it is sliding anteriorly from over the sclera towards the scleral spur. So actually the contraction of the ciliary muscles pulls the ciliary body anteriorly towards the scleral spur and when the entire ciliary body moves slightly anteriorly then the tension on the suspensory ligament of the lens is released. When the tension on the suspensory ligament of the lens is released the lens automatically becomes more curved. Why the lens automatically becomes more curved? Because in the resting position of the eye the lens is already stretched. So in the resting position you must remember the lens is already under tension. Only when you decrease the pressure on the suspensory ligament the tension on the lens will be released and because of the inherent elasticity of the lens lens will become a smaller ball and a more convex ball. So always the natural tendency of the lens is to become shorter and more convex but in our eyes the lens is always held in a stretched position. So we are always holding the lens stretched and in a flat position. And as soon as you contract the ciliary muscles and as soon as you relax the tension on the suspensory ligament, the lens will naturally fold up into a more convex ball and it will focus the object closer on the retina and this is the phenomenon of accommodation.
whenever you are looking at a near object there is a contraction of the ciliary body and the ciliary muscles in fact and there is a relaxation or the tension on the suspensory ligament and the lens automatically becomes more convex to focus on a nearer object therefore if you are constantly looking at nearer objects you are constantly using the ciliary muscles and this is the reason why sometimes you feel fatigue when you are constantly peering at near objects now the neural pathway of accommodation we will discuss some other time when we supply when we study the optic nerve pathway or the visual pathway along with the visual pathway you have to study the light reflex pathway as well as the accommodation reflex pathway so we won't go the details of the neural networks of accommodation but the ultimate mechanism of accommodation is by the contraction of the ciliary muscles that much is clear so let's see what else is left here again in this diagram you can look at the blood vessels within the vascular layer of the choroid and as we said the sclera is equivalent to the dura mater of the central nervous system so if you have the dura mater around the dura mater you have the dural blood vessels so around the optic nerve outside you have the dural blood vessels and deep to the sclera within the choroid you have the choroidal blood vessels so the long and short posterior ciliary vessels that are actually piercing around the optic nerve and going between the sclera and the uh, retina into the uh, uveal tract or along the choroid they are partly dural blood vessels they are partly pial blood vessels so these long and short posterior ciliary vessels they are accompanied by the vessels pial vessels and all combine to form the vascular network within the Uh, choroid and not only that the episcleral veins so apart from these long and short posterior ciliary arteries uh, you have and the dural vessels and the pial vessels you also have episcleral veins now these veins some of these episcleral veins they unite to form the vortex veins which actually pierce the sclera behind the equator so this is the entire map of the blood vessels contributing to the choroid the long and short posterior ciliary vessels the pial vessels the dural vessels the veni vorticosi and passing anteriorly into the ciliary body and the margin of the iris at the root of the iris you have the major arterial circle which is derived from the anterior ciliary arteries and veins which derive from the uh, blood vessels supplying the extraocular muscles and at the free margin of the iris you have a minor arterial circle so major arterial circle anteriorly minor arterial circle anteriorly and the choroidal blood vessels posteriorly contributed to by the long and short posterior ciliary vessels and the pial and dural vessels and the exit of the veni vorticosi and you must keep in mind that from the inside from the retinal surface you have the supply area of the central vessels of the retina the central arteries and the central vein so this is a very beautiful diagram displaying the blood supply of the eyeball so let us go to the next picture here this is a much more detailed diagram of the blood supply of the eyeball and you can make out all the long and short posterior ciliary vessels over here piercing the sclera and what is important these episcleral veins merging into the vortex veins that is the veni vorticosi they are going in the superior and the inferior ocular veins so this is a much more detailed and impressive diagram of the blood supply of the eye ball now here we are going into the innermost layer that is the retina and we have already said the posterior part of the retina is the neural part of the retina and as the eye ball develops from the optic cup the retina actually has got a part which is derived from the outer layer of the optic cup and the retina has got a part which is derived from the inner layer of the optic cup we will study the development of the eyeball at some other time but the eyeball is developed from a cup shaped prolongation of the diencephalon and actually the retina is developed from that cup shaped prolongation so this cup has got an outer layer and an inner layer just like the bowman's capsule of the kidney and this outer layer of the retina forms the pigmented layer and the inner layer forms the neural layer. so the nervous and nervous layers of the retina fuse together although there is always a scope a potential detachment of the inner layers of the retina from the outer pigmented layer of the retina so this retina the posterior part of the retina is 
nervous and so the non neural part of the retina extends anteriorly over the ciliary body and the iris as the ciliary part of the retina and the ideal part of the retina and here in the posterior part of the retina you can make out the optic disc that is the blind spot this is the region where the optic nerve has entered the retina or the optic nerve has entered the eyeball actually it is the reverse it is the region where the optic nerve fibers leave the retina and enter the optic nerve and you can make out that somewhere here must be the posterior pole of the eyeball so that the blind spot is slightly medial to the posterior pole and the fovea centralis and the macula lutea or the yellow spot are slightly lateral to the posterior pole so this is the medial side this is the lateral side and you can make out that at from the blind spot over here you have a slight cupping of the sclera so the sclera is slightly depressed over here this is called the physiological cup and this is because of the intraocular pressure which is pushing the perforated part of the sclera here outward so there is a slight cupping over here and this is these are actually the margins of that optic cup so the optic disc actually is the margin of the optic cup and at the optic disc you can make out the entry of the central artery and vein of the retina that is the central vessels of the retina and you can make out that upon entering into the retina they have given the superior nasal inferior nasal superior temporal and inferior temporal branches so superior nasal inferior nasal superior temporal inferior temporal branches the nasal branches passing medially to the peripheral retina the temporal branches passing laterally to the peripheral retina and these temporal branches are supplying the macula lutea and the fovea centralis with smaller and smaller branches and no large artery actually crosses through the macula lutea so that its clarity is maintained and the maximum acuity of vision can be maintained at the macula lutea and the fovea centralis now we need to go into the histology of the retina for a little bit the thing that first we will look at a schematic of the histology and then a diagrammatic part of the retinal cells so here you have a schematic histology of the retina of course you have it of the whole eyeball you can make out the sclera here and you can make out the choroid here and the supracoroidal layer over here with the melanocytes the pigments and you know the supracoroidal lamina is the layer up to which the ciliary muscles of the ciliary body extend and you can make out the pigments in the choroid and you can make out the choriocular capillary layer which is the uh, layer which is close to the retina and which nourishes the outer layers of the retina and then you have another membrane the supracoroidal lamina and you have a brush membrane now beyond if you come to the retina proper first layer would be this pigment layer of the retina now you must make out that the uh, entry of light actually is from here to here so actually this is the outer part of the eyeball this is the inner surface of the eyeball so actually light actually has to cross through all the layers of the retina before it can stimulate the rods and cones in this layer so it is not that the rods and cones are in the innermost layer and the light will come and directly strike the rods and cones light has to pass through all layers of the retina before striking the rods and cones and so that they are not refracted in different directions from the retina therefore you have the pigmentary layer of the retina and you have additional pigment in the choroid underneath it so the first layer of the retina is this pigmented layer and then you have the layer of rods and cones so here you have the rods and cones actually these are the outer segments of the rods and cones the rods are rod shaped cone shaped and you know the rods are more abundant in the periphery and the cones are more abundant towards the central part of the retina and at the yellow spot or the macula lutea, lutea you only have cones you don't have any rods and towards the ora serrata you have very few cones and you have a large number of rods only and you know that the rods are responsible for dim light vision and the cones are responsible for bright light vision and color vision so again you have the pigmentary layer and you have the layer of rods and cones that is the outer segment of the rods and cones then you have the external limiting membrane these are actually a network formed by the processes of the glial cells 
within the retina. So you have Muller's glial cells and these cells form the outer limiting membrane. Then you have an outer nuclear layer. These are actually the nuclei of the rods and cones. So what you here have the outer segments of the rods and cones. Over here you have the nuclei of the rods and cones. Then you have an external plexiform layer. Internal plexiform layer means you have a synapse between the rods and cones and the bipolar cells. So after rods and cones, the next layer level of relay are the bipolar cells. So here you have the synaptic zone between the rods and cones and the bipolar cells forming the outer plexiform layer. Then you have the inner nuclear layer which where you have the nuclei of the bipolar cells as well as the amacrine cells and so these uh, inner nuclear layer here you come to the second level of cells and in this second level of cells you have the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells. These horizontal cells and amacrine cells so amacrine cells so here towards the rods and cones and horizontal cells over here they help for lateral integration of the stimulus so in this inner nuclear layer you have the nuclei of the bipolar cells the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells then you come to the inner plexiform layer in this inner plexiform layer you have a synapse between the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells so the nuclei of the rods and cones nuclei of the bipolar cells amacrine cells and horizontal cells and the nuclei of the ganglion cells these are the main nuclei layers and over here in the internal plexiform layer you have the synapse between the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells and beyond that you have the ganglion cell layer over here where you have the nuclei of the ganglion cells and beyond that you have the optic nerve or nerve fiber layer where you have the axons of the ganglion cells. So these axons of the ganglion cells, these are actually going to form the optic nerve. And finally you have the internal limiting membrane formed by the processes of the glial cells within the retina. So you have one external limiting membrane over here, you have one internal limiting membrane over here, you have three sets of cell nuclei nuclei of the rods and cones, nuclei of the bipolar cells, horizontal cells and amacrine cells and nuclei of the ganglion cells. And you have two sets of synaptic layers, outer plexiform layer for synapses between the bipolar cells, uh, between the rods and cones and the bipolar cells, inner plexiform layer for the synapse between bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. So these are all the layers of the retina and we will look at them in a more clarified way in the next diagram. Here you can see all the layers again, but again here the diagram has been drawn from here to here. So this is the choroidal layer and this is the inner nerve fiber layer. So this is the external surface, this is the internal surface. So from the choroid you start at the retina, the pigment layer of the retina, number one, then the outer segments of the rods and cones, then you have the outer limiting membrane over here, then the outer nuclear layer that is the nuclei of the rods and cones, then you have an outer plexiform layer where you have the synapse between the rods and cones and the bipolar cells and at the synaptic layer on the outermost layer you have the amacrine cells and on the innermost layer you have the, the outermost layer you have the horizontal cells and the inner layer you have the amacrine cells. So these uh, horizontal cells and amacrine cells, they help in transverse integration of the uh, nerve impulses. And then you have an internal nuclear layer, we have already said where you have the nuclei of these three sets of cells. The bipolar cells, the amacrine cells and the horizontal cells. And then you have an internal plexiform layer, where you have a synapse between the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. And you have a ganglionic cell layer where you have the cell body of the ganglion cells and you have a nerve fiber layer where the axons of these ganglion cells are going into the optic nerve and you have an internal limiting membrane. Now this histology of the retina is important. By and large you have to remember the cells that are relaying within the retina that's the rods and cones, the bipolar cells, the horizontal cells, the amacrine cells and the ganglion cells. And you have to understand that there are two synaptic layers, one 
between the nodes and cones and bipolar horizontal cells and over here again a synapse between the bipolar cells and the amacrine cells and the dendrites of the ganglion cells so look at this diagram time and again this diagram i think will be more important than this uh, histological drawing over here so this schematic diagram will give you a clear idea of the relay of different cells in the retina and please go through your books uh, i may have left out certain minor details so there is more to it then you have to see a little, bit, little more about the cataract and glaucoma but as far as possible as as much as can be encompassed within a short time we have tried to say in this video thank you